Well, I started out in Ohio. I grew up in southwestern Ohio near Cincinnati, and I attended Miami University in Ohio, Miami of Ohio, some people call it. And I was yes. a math major. So this was in the 60s, the early 60s. So uh, some people will remember that the Vietnam War was uh, raging at that time. And uh, I had a low draft number. And I would have been drafted had I not stayed in school. So I got a master's degree in, oh, yes. in mathematics at, uh, at Miami. And then um, after that, they were also giving, they gave what was called deferment. So I'll have to say that war had uh, an influence on my career path. At that point, after I graduated with my master's degree in math, I continued on as a teacher for a while. I taught at Randolph-Macon College for two years. That's just uh, north of, uh, of Richmond. And I taught at the College of William and Mary. Um, for a couple of years. The William and Mary was actually the first one, and they were offering these temporary positions. Mm -hmm. And at that point, by the time that uh, year rolled around, which I guess was 1972, the war was winding down, and mm -hmm. I had almost aged out of the window where they were taking uh, soldiers to go over there. And so I continued my education, and I went to Iowa State University, mm -hmm. where I was to, was mentored by a an advisor Wayne Fuller, um, Professor Fuller and I worked out something called the Dickey Fuller test, and that uh, I just looked this morning, um, I that the papers that we wrote out of that um, out of that research have been cited 45,000 times in the scientific literature, oh, and awesome. I it, it is incredible. <laughs> Uh, and that if you sort of think about it, uh, a scientific, well, three scientific papers have been written citing that work every day since I graduated on average. So that's, uh, that's something I was, of course, very, very happy about. Um, I've written maybe 70 some papers, I guess, over my career, but the two or three that we wrote at the beginning, that's that's really where my reputation came from. Then I joined the faculty at North Carolina State University. And one of my students, John Brocklebank, who's done very well at SAS, um, he asked me in his early career there at, at SAS Institute, would I help write a course on time series? We did that, and we taught it together for a while. Um, and then another colleague, Herbert Kirk, who uh, was at NC State when I came to interview and then um, joined the group at SAS, he suggested that we write a, a book about time series, which is uh, exactly what we did. And that was a, a very nice experience. And as you know, we are in the process of finishing up the third edition of that. One more sort of interesting thing, maybe for the people who are listening, um, when I came to interview, I met a guy named Jim Goodnight in the department and another guy named John Saul in the department. And so uh, those were in the, um, the group, the research group that formed SAS. And of course, you know Dr. Goodnight, uh, you know John Saul. There was another uh, person, Tony Barr, that I met when I came here to interview. By the time I joined NC State University Department of Statistics, those fellows had moved across the street to a building that they were renting, and they started SAS Institute. And uh, the rest is history. They've done incredibly well, and we're, we're very proud of the folks that, that came from here. I've had several students that uh, went out to SAS and ended up working there. Uh, the only other thing I guess I might mention is I had a, a sabbatical leave one year, and I worked at the U.S. Census Bureau. That was a, a good experience as well. Um, I've been teaching. I teach all. I only teach graduate students, and I do research. I've had maybe 16 or 17 PhD students that finished up under my uh, my leadership, and yes, I am a specialized in uh, statistics. Yeah, I uh, I did have a couple of nice things happen to me along the way. I am a fellow of the American Statistical Association, which is a, a nice honor. And at one point, I don't know if it's still true, but I was the most highly cited researcher in our entire university. 
Um, the library did a study uh, about that. So, um, so it's been a very nice career for me. I recently, just last year, went on what's called phased retirement, so I'm a half-time person now. I teach one course in data mining and I do consulting with our agricultural and life science groups here. And uh, kind of winding down toward the end of my career, I turned 71 last year, so uh, I'm even drawing Social Security. Sure. Well, I think one thing that helped me tremendously in understanding how SAS works, and I would advise anyone uh, starting out with SAS and wanting to do some programming, I would advise them to learn about the program data vector. This idea of a program data vector, which not everyone is familiar with, but it was, uh, I believe it was actually Jim Barr in the early days that came up with that program data vector, but it enables SAS to be very efficient in terms of data manipulation. Um, it also, if you learn about the program data vector, you'll understand much better what the retain and drop and keep statements do and about how data sets are merged and concatenated, how they uh, can be read into themselves uh, in a way that creates new variables that weren't in there to start with. So I would certainly advise people to get up to speed on the program data vector. Um, the, the other thing or one other thing that I would suggest doing if you are lucky enough to be in an environment like I am where there are other experienced SAS users is to talk to each other. Uh, simply uh, talking to each other, finding out what people are doing, um, asking for help when you have problems. I've learned a tremendous amount from uh, a couple of people here whose job was just doing uh, SAS programming for clients. Uh, Joyce Smith and Sandy Donahue uh, were our two main SAS programmers when I came to work here and I've, I've worked with them for a long time. I've learned a tremendous amount from them. And then the third thing that I would suggest that people do is to play around with SAS. Uh, in other words, you can learn a lot by just experimenting. And of course, as a statistician, I like experimenting. Uh, and I think most people who are, who are curious and are interested in learning things like to experiment around and see what they can find in, in the software. One more thing I guess maybe I should mention, if, if you don't mind, uh, is if, if you're not in an environment where you have other SAS uh, programmers and people that know SAS to work with, I would suggest going to the meetings. We have regional SAS meetings, we have uh, local SAS meetings, and then of course there's SAS Global Forum. And those are venues where you'll meet a lot of other people that are interested in SAS and typically very enthusiastic about SAS. And I think if you go to some of those talks and, and chat with people, uh, in in your spare time there, you'll you'll learn a lot. <laughs> well, I've got to say, Proc Arima it has the Dicky Fuller test in it, so there's there's not much competition there in in my mind, and maybe not anybody else's mind. But actually, uh, this Proc Arima is what people use for mathematical forecasting and statistical forecasting. So I think a lot of people that use SAS, and I've been teaching courses for SAS since 1981, I guess. That's another thing. I'm a, I'm a contract instructor for, for SAS. Uh, and often in talking to folks um, from other classes at, at lunch or after a break or something like that, uh, often what they want to do is forecast. Uh, who doesn't want to be able to predict what's going to happen in the future? So. Um, I think that uh, proc arena is a very strong procedure, and it's, uh, in my opinion, it has, um, it's kind of the Cadillac of forecasting procedures. It's been around for a while. There are some new uh, things that are out there that basically automate some things and make them maybe a little easier to access. There's Forecast Studio and some other GUIs that are out there. Uh, and some new procedures like the PROC ESM, the unobserved components models, those kinds of things. But really, if you look at them, take a little deep dive into what they're doing, uh, what you find is that these uh, kind of ARIMA concepts, ARIMA stands for Auto Regressive Integrated Moving Average. 
I, I don't know why we come up with these names that are so so sort of complicated and and obscure. But anyway, that's uh, that that's that's Arima. But, but for many of these kind of GUIs and things, really Arima kinds of models are going on under the covers when you look into it. So that's what I like a lot. Um, I also like to ride to drive a standard ship car where most people would. <laughs> With like an automatic, but I like to have that uh, that degree of control that sometimes with a GUI you you perhaps lose just a little bit of that of that uh, sort of hands-on control that you have uh, with maybe some of the other procedures that are not quite as automated. Right. So it just makes it all the more interesting. Yeah, I think so. And another thing, if if I can mention a couple other things that I think are are uh, favorite procedures of mine, um, I teach design of experiments, and it it's kind of amazing uh, how many concepts of design of experiments, uh, like blocking and incomplete blocks and things like that, that some of your statistician listeners will will understand and and recognize. Uh, so many of those things involve exactly what happens in mixed models. So ProtMix, which by the way was initially written by one of our NC State graduates, uh, is is another one of my of my favorites. And I think that ProtMix really was a game changer in terms of statistical analysis, especially of experimental data. In other words, when you when you run an experiment like a clinical trial or something like that. Um, it often involves a mixture of what, what we call fixed and random effects. And the place where you can handle that correctly and nicely uh, and rigorously is, is indeed prot mix. And one more, if you have time for one more, um, I've explored a little bit of the SG graphics, and uh, they're, they're so nice, um, so much better than the graphics that we had before. Uh, so I, I like PROC SG plot, for example, as very nice for making plots. And I think that um, uh, some of the folks at SAS, Bob Rodriguez being one of them, um, made a, an effort also to have graphics associated with uh, most of the procedures, the ones that really would uh, logically um, support graphics. And that's a tremendous boon, I think, to the to the researchers. You can run PROC REG, which is one of the basic statistical procedures, and there are lots of diagnostic plots that come out of there, uh, other plots that are optional. And you know, uh, <laughs> when you have an old expression, uh, there's probably a reason that it's an old expression. And one of the ones that would be relevant here is that expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. So there's a, there's a lot to be gained by uh, making good graphs. In fact, I try to tell my students, if you try to analyze data without plotting it, I hope you have your statistical malpractice insurance paid up because that's exactly uh, what it is to analyze data without first just taking a look, a visual look at what's going on. Um, well, I have enjoyed teaching and using SAS over the years. I think the fact that I use SAS in the classroom um, has been something that the students have appreciated. Um, there is a lot more competition out there now. Uh, that Certainly SAS has a lot more competition than when I first came here. Um, I, I do a lot of different things. I do research and it involves sometimes extremely large simulations. SAS is good for that if you know what you're doing, and uh, it's never failed me. And I think one of the things that is nice about SAS is it, there is a little bit of a steep learning curve to get started, but really most of what you want to do is in there. So you don't have to use one package for analysis and another one for graphics and another one for tables and another one for uh, reports. So um, it's, it's a nice, complete package. It's very well vetted in the sense that they have a, uh, a technical support um, department that helps you. And also, uh, they have a, a group that carefully studies uh, what's going on, a quality control group, I guess you could say. Um, they pour a lot of money into research and making SES better year after year. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of what they've done. A lot of our graduates uh, 
work there. Uh, we're proud of them. We're proud of the people at SAS. And so it's it's been a pleasure for me, really, over the years to uh, to have a chance to teach SAS, to work with SAS, uh, to teach for SAS. I teach, as I said, short courses, um, books by users. I've enjoyed that program. Got a lot of help from the folks there at SAS Institute in uh, writing uh, books, and um, that's that's been very nice for me. I got a very nice uh, honor from Dr. Goodnight a couple years ago at SAS Global Forum. I was selected as the SAS Distinguished Professor uh, for that year, so that was uh, was nice. Congratulations on that. It's been a real pleasure having you here with us, and um, it was wonderful to uh, to listen to you. And uh, we thank you once again for all your useful information and interesting information. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Dr. Dickey.